So we're sitting with Dr. Kopano Machamabaso and we're sitting with Dineo Lusenga. Please tell us what you do. We'll start with you. Okay, so I am a medical doctor by training. I've spent most of my career in public health, so that's where my passion lies. I'm also a novelist. Um, I've recently written three novels and I'm a mom. Okay. I am a TV producer, uh, I make TV, I make films, I'm an actress as well, and I'm a presenter, I've just got off presenting a show for SABC2, and radio presenter, uh, which <laughs> I haven't done in a while, but yeah, um, I've got a lot of experience in radio as well. And what brings you two together? I mean, how did you meet? <laughs> because you're making a movie, do you know you're making a movie, that you, is an adaptation of um, Copano's debut novel, Coconut. Right. I must say acclaimed debut novel. It's important to put that in there, right? Um, how did you two meet? So we met after months and months of me pursuing um, to be optioned for um, Kobana's novel Coconut film rights. Um, and, you know, it was months of talking to her representatives, her agent, her publishers. And then eventually it got down to us meeting to finalize everything, you know, on paper and to get her very famous and expensive signature. <laughs> <laughs> and that's and that's how we met. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, we've been observing you on set today and to me, I don't know about everybody else, but it felt like you've known each other forever. Was it one of those things where you met and you were like, oh, soulmates? Yes, kindred spirits for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, I read Gobano's book many, many years ago and she went on to release two other books after that. But when I read Coconut, I was just like, oh my God, who's this girl? You know, and to find out that she was a first year student at the time, still studying mm -hmm. medicine, I've always like idolized her. And when I met her, so when her agent suggested that we meet, because we could have just signed the contract remotely, right. you know, but then she was like, I think it would be nice for you guys to meet. And we met um, last year sometime. And we, I thought it was going to be like a short meeting, signed contract and everyone goes home. But we ended up just like having lunch yeah. and chatting yeah. for like hours on end. So I do think there was a connection for sure from, from yeah, the you. first time we met. Yeah. So, Kapano, when Dino approached you, what was it that made you say yes? So, um, she wrote an incredibly heartfelt letter about why she's passionate about the movie to my publishers, which they shared with me. And reading it, it really moved me, brought me to tears because it reminded me a lot of the same younger self who took a chance on a book with no you know, experience in writing. Her vision, her passion just came through. She got the concept, she got what the book was about. Yeah, and I just felt excited to meet this person behind this letter. Um, and excited that also the book that can get a second chance to to meet other people and be um, shared on platforms that had never been shared on before. Yeah. And have you read Coconut? Like, you know, you wrote it, you, it was published, you read it. Have you like read it since? No, not at all. And it's actually really awkward when people ask me about like, I'm hopeful so and so. <laughs> no. Because it's, I mean, it's over 10 years ago now. Yeah. And I almost cringe a little bit because I think it's like reading your like, you know, stuff that you wrote when you were young and you... I think I, my voice has changed over the years mm. and my writing style and my interests. I'm, I'm proud of the book because I think... I'm proud of that 21-year-old that got it published. Um, but yeah, I find, it, I find it strange to go back to it. So then, in terms of putting together the movie, I mean, I know it's the very early stages, but how's it been going and how are you feeling about it? I'll ask you, Daniel. Um. I'm very nervous, to be quite honest. It's a very scary experience. And I said to Gobano when we met today that, you know, all the, the attention that it has gotten us, when they, they announced, the publishers and, and the agency announced in December that, you know, the book was going to be turned into a film, I didn't expect such a positive reaction. Mm -hmm. I mean, sure, you want people to be happy, but I didn't think so many people, you know, um, shared the same excitement that I had about the book and I didn't realize how much it meant to a lot more people and everyone came and said oh who's this girl making this movie you better not mess it up and I thought oh my god but there are equally as many people coming and saying I want to be a part of this project mm -hmm. so it's it's scary but it's also very very exciting knowing that you know we're about to embark on something really 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 special um, it's going well mm -hmm. It is still early stages, so have a couple of names of people um, that I want to be a part of this. We've started some conversations, um, a lot of it going very well at the moment, and we will share everything as it as and when it unfolds. Okay. Yeah. So as we covered in the intro that I made you both do, which I feel like made you both internally cringe, having to tell us who you are. I do this and I do that, but you're both multi-skilled uh, and multifaceted. I mean. 
number one for you, Kapano, which came first of all the things that you're doing with your life? Which one was like the original? You know, I mean, I'm a typical sort of black child that writing was never going to be a career. Yeah. So even though it had been there in the background, it was never something I ever thought I would live off. I mean, I, I, I enjoyed school. I did okay in science and maths. I, I, I like being in the caring profession. So medicine was a good fit for me and I, and I love it and I do love it. But I think writing was a little bit of like a mistress Nyana on the side, yeah. a side chick. <laughs> um, and so I think I've been really fortunate that, you know, it's become what it has. Um, but I still like sort of my, my public health work because I think I, I care deeply about people's stories and I feel to be a good writer, you need to live in the world and experience life and I could never write in a vacuum. So yeah, I've enjoyed kind of dabbling in both worlds. Mm. And what about you, Danielle? I would say acting because when I left, high school to go study drama was what I was going to pursue you know and even when I applied I remember my dad saying so you don't have a second option and I was like no and he was like so if you don't get accepted I was like well I guess I'm not going to varsity <laughs> and luckily I got accepted yeah. so I went and I did drama but when I was there then I discovered radio I never ever ever thought that I'd be on radio ever um, and Tembisa was the programs manager for Voice of Vits at the time. And she came to me one day and she's like, oh, we're training people for campus registration. Are you interested? And I remember thinking, oh, that is so weird. Why would anyone walk up to me and say that? And I was like, sure, whatever. And literally that's how I got into radio because campus led to YFM, led to mm -hmm. Metro FM, and then eventually, you know, 5FM. So I think everything was a discovery, but leaving home and leaving high school, I wanted to pursue acting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And so, then you were on 5 FM. When I met you, you were like a, yeah, you were a famous DJ. I think, I feel like I can say that. Um, and then you just left. I mean, nobody leaves number one radio. Nobody leaves one of the biggest stations in the country. What on earth made you say, okay, I'm done? Right. So that is always the most difficult question to answer because it doesn't make sense to anyone. And for a while, it didn't make sense to me. But I got to a point where I could articulate how I felt at the time. So. I was on 5 FM and I was doing the Ultimix Weekend Edition, which I had just taken over from Euphonic. So everyone was just like, oh my God, you just got a show and Euphonic was doing it before you. And when you do that show, it's almost like an expectation to become a DJ, like a club DJ. So I was this girl doing the Saturday night dance show. I'm in the clubs every weekend. I'm playing. Listen, I'm making good money. So yeah. everyone's just like, you are living <laughs> the life. But the storyteller in me felt neglected mm. and I felt like I wasn't I wasn't even building that and I remember Euphonic saying to me one time we were at a gig and I was playing after him and I think a few days after that he said to me so what is it that you want to do like but do you see yourself do you want to be this big DJ one day and I remember thinking oh my god no and he said so what do you see yourself doing say in five years and I remember saying, I want to act, I want to tell stories, I want to make a film. And he said, so what are you doing here? Why are we in this club mm. right now with you about to play? And that's when things started to turn in my head. And I thought, oh my God, he said, you have to harness that, that you see doing in the future. And that's when I started thinking about, mm. okay, maybe not that I don't love radio, but right now radio is distracting me from my bigger picture and my future plans. Mm. And I left and I got an opportunity to go study at the New York Film Academy and I went to uh, the programs managers. Initially I said to them, okay guys, for three months I'll be back. And yeah. they were like, who do you think you are? <laughs> <laughs> and then that's how I left five and then I left and then I came back and my life was never the same again. No so no regrets at all. So to answer your question, I feel like I went around. I left to go find my voice as a storyteller. Do you feel like you felt you found your voice as a yeah. storyteller? Completely. I, I do feel like I have found it, but I'm still growing in that space as well. Mm. Yeah. Speaking of voices, I mean, you're a writer. The, the most important thing for a writer is a voice. Mm. But you've also used your voice as a doctor. I mean, tell us about some of the work that you do outside of being Dr. Kopano about my yes. about. Yeah, so I work in public health, run yeah. a campaign um, that focuses on childhood nutrition. Um, we actually have a big challenge in South Africa that often goes unnoticed, particularly in pregnancy. Um, we don't have any support. So if you're a poor woman, you're pretty much kind of, you need to take care of yourself, right? Um, and it has long-term consequences for children's well-being. Um, so we're working to, one, make people aware of the challenges that many South African women are facing, raising children in pregnancy, having young children, but also that it's a loss to our economy, that if we don't protect that precious human capital in these early days of life, we are denying ourselves sort of 
benefiting from that later on. So mm. that's kind of um, what I do in my public health work. And, you know, I don't think they're so different. I think I, I think working with people, working in public health, you have to listen. You have to listen to people's stories. You have to make yourself vulnerable. Um, and you need the same kind of thing when you're sitting down and you're writing. So, I mean, people often ask, they seem to be quite different sort of parts of your life, but actually I think they feed off each other. Mm. And speaking of making yourself vulnerable, I mean, mm. is that a difficult or an easy thing to do? Considering, I feel, and correct me if you feel differently, um, but that, you know, if today we, we live in such a, well, the privileged ones, right? We mm -hmm. live in a world where you can do many different things. You don't right. have to just stick to one thing. Um, and But that's a lot of pressure. Mm. And, you know, if you are like a DJ who is also a novelist, who is also a doctor, um, you're sort of expected to be especially if you're good at all of them, you're expected to be good at them, at, good at good at all of them all of the time. Right. And there's no space for being vulnerable mm. or like showing your human side. Do you guys ever feel that way? Do you ever feel that pressure either externally or from yourselves? I mean, I definitely did after writing Coconut. Yeah. You know, the beauty of writing Coconut, there was no audience, right? I didn't even think it was going to get published. I was doing it for myself. Mm. It did much better than I could have ever imagined, which made writing spilt milk really hard. Mm. But I think quickly recognizing that you, if, you, it's, if you really want to write authentic, if you want to speak truth, you want to be true to yourself, you have to ignore the fact that somebody might read this. And I think protecting that was probably the best thing that I did and allowed me to write Smoke Milk and Period Pain, both of which I'm very proud of. Um, and I think in terms of the pressure, I mean, I, I, my writing is really self-indulgent, so I, I make sure that, you know, my job is what I cover my bills with, mm. but my writing I protect. Like, it mm. does, if it takes me another 10 years before my next book comes out, that is fine. Mm. Like, there is, I don't allow, because it's such a precious thing to me, and because I know that putting anxiety around it will maybe make my, my writing not as good as it could be, I don't put any kind of sort of time or goals or anything around my writing. Okay. What about you, Dina? I certainly feel feel pressure, but it's, it's the kind of pressure that you have to talk yourself out of all the time. Mm -hmm. um, same as what Gobano was saying, protecting yourself from that. But I do find it difficult because sometimes you're in your own space and you can, you know, talk yourself out of it and say, okay, it's going to be fine. You don't have to like live up to expectations and and and. But then you bump into people and they say things and they ask you questions like, oh, so. How's radio going? And you're like, oh, well, I'm not on radio anymore. Why? Why? And then, then you go back and you're like, oh, maybe I didn't make the best decision, you know? And then mm. someone el else asks about the next thing, like, oh, so I hear you're doing coconut. Oh my God, how's that going? So you feel like you have to exist in all these spaces, mm. but excel at it. And sometimes mm. you can't be everything at all at the same time, mm. you know? So you choose that right now this is what I want to focus on. And you feel like you have to explain it to everyone. And it's a difficult kind of space to, to, to exist in. Um, but I guess, I guess I've, never thought it, I've never thought about it like that, like protecting yourself mm. from that. It's something that I'm gonna have to learn. Mm. Yeah. And finally, I mean, that, that's such a perfect place to end it, but I have to ask you this question. In like all the years you've lived so far, which is not a lot, to be honest, <laughs> but what's like the greatest lesson that you have learned about anything? Oh my God, um, shut all the external voices out. Mm -hmm. It's difficult, but you have to do it for yourself. Mm -hmm. Your parents, your partner sometimes, your friends, decide what it is that you want to do and do it for yourself. And even if it fails, whatever it is, and you look back and you think, oh, maybe that's not what I wanted to do at the time. No experience is ever in vain. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is that you think you want to do at the time is probably what it's going to take to get you to your next destination. Yeah, I would say trust your voice. I mean, I still marvel. Even my most recent novel, Period Pain, just the reception in all sorts of parts of the world, like Poland and places that I would never think there would be a readership. So I think often, I mean, and I'm, I can be very, I can doubt myself. I can talk myself out. I can say, this is a stupid idea. This is dumb. You're wasting your time. You're old now. <laughs> like you need to focus your life. So I think it is trusting your voice, trusting your instincts, trusting the passions that you have inside of you. And that remembering there is only one you and that it, it's quite hard to be alive. Like what it takes to be born and conceived is quite miraculous. And so you are here for a reason. There will never be one like you. So, you know, make it worthwhile. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Time is precious and thank you for sharing some of your thoughts with us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.